That's interesting. Okay. Go live now. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Harass's global meeting and the special main plenary title, Sustainable Energy Solutions for the Digital Economy. By way of introduction, my name is Stephen Melnick. I'm a founder of politicalbusinessdiplomacy.org, an organization that assists country leaders achieve their economic political goals globally. Tenure professor and programs director at City University of New York, Baruch College, the largest business school in the U.S., partner in Swiss Financiers Global Investment Bank, where we take companies from all over the world, public on Wall Street, and last but not least, I proudly serve as an honorary board member of Lieberland Aid Foundation, which provides very much needed humanitarian aid around the world. Most importantly for today, however, I'm very grateful to harass this organization where I'm honored to serve as a director and to its tr truly extraordinary founder and visionary, Dr. Frank Richter, for the amazing high impact and transformational work that we at Harassus are able to carry out globally. And now it gives me enormous pleasure to introduce my outmost distinguished plenary participants. And how wonderful, what a perfect timing. So uh, first, uh, um, uh, I'd like to start and welcome to the plenary, Deputy Prime Minister, Minister of Finance, former Minister of Economy, Energy and Tourism, Bulgaria, Mr. Asen Vasiliev. Uh, we'll have virtual uh, ovations, but for now, just please uh, greet everybody. I'd like to welcome to the plenary Deputy Minister to the President of Research and Innovation of Cyprus, Mr. Uh, Kyriakos uh, Kokinos. Welcome. Uh, we're also fortunate to have someone who served as a Prime Minister, Minister of Foreign Affairs and Minister of Finance of Montenegro, uh, Mr. Igor Luksic. Hello. And we are to have a former prime minister of Tunisia with us as well, who ran for presidential office, Mr. Yosef Shahed. And last but not least, I'm absolutely delighted to have with us today a founder and chief executive officer of Innovation 4.4 out of U.S., investor, entrepreneur, pioneer in biometric innovation, sustainability, thought leader, futurist, academic, and family office advisor, Ms. Lina Konstantinovic. All right. Well, we, I think we have an absolutely amazing and well-curated lineup. Before we commence our discussion, I would like to first just take a quick moment and sincerely thank each and every one of our distinguished participants in this plenary for so graciously accepting my personal invitation, taking time from your busy schedules to join me today. I have no doubt this will be very good, informative, and certainly very timely discussion. So... Digital economy has enormous energy-related needs. Many areas around the world are experiencing energy shortages, shortages due to crypto mining and other activities. Yet, digital economy and related energy needs are continuing to skyrocket. It's obvious that sustainable energy solutions is what will drive the sector forward. What are some of the best practices in the industry? Uh, what can be adopted by governments and private sectors globally? What have governments already done in this direction? Mr. Kakinos, uh, since you're in the Minister of Innovation and this topic deals a lot with, with these type of matters, I would like to start with you with your permission. Uh, what is being done in Cyprus right now? What are some of the best practices that you could share with the rest of the world leaders today? Please. If your question is around how digital uh, is an enabler for uh, managing the, and coping with the energy crisis and the climate uh, crisis that our region is undergoing, um, I think that uh, our flagship uh, project is uh, because of the situation in our country and in the region. Uh, we're not into we're in a climate crisis. You know that uh, Eastern Mediterranean region is uh, experiencing uh, severe climate uh, challenges, and uh, our focus is on uh, energy, renewable energy, using the sun. That we have plenty of sun. Um, almost 355 days a year, we have sunny days. Uh, so uh, the flagship project in, in the country is, um, and it's not just in the country, it's a regional effort. Uh, there is a, a move, an initiative driven by Cyprus on uh, how renewable energy, uh, solar energy, is uh, a, can help us cope with uh, these uh, challenges. 
Now, um, the digital part of it, okay, is uh, how we can use the new technologies, especially uh, Internet of Things, connectivity sensors, as well as space communication. Why space communication? Because space communication is a great instrument for Earth observation. So we put a lot of money on new technologies that are uh, around IoT, as well as space communication, exactly for this reason. This is our flagship project. Beautiful. Space communication. So that's something to, to note, I think. Uh, Mr. Vasiliev, I think you're in a wonderful situation uh, for many reasons, but one of which we talk about energy. Um, Bulgaria has been on top of the game for many years, and uh, I believe uh, for close to 40 years from our discussion uh, has been kind of that export and the largest exporter uh, to the rest of the European country, for most of them anyway. Uh, and I know there's a lot of uh, kind of unorthodox approaches that Bulgaria is taking in the direction of um, moving towards sustainability. Can you share some of your uh, latest developments, please? Uh, sure. Um, since the 70s, we've had a very robust and very orthodox, I would say, energy system. Uh, coal, nuclear, uh, quite a lot of hydro. Um, and uh, in the 80s, we built uh, pumped hydro uh, as uh, storage and balancing um, with pretty large capacity, about 840 megawatts. Um, the system overall is about uh, 10,000 megawatts, and we have about 2,000 megawatts of exports uh, reliably over the years. Uh, since 2013, we've built quite a bit of solar, uh, similar to uh, our friends in, in Cyprus. We don't have quite as much sun, but uh, we do have quite a lot, uh, uh, and some wind. Um, and that has uh, given us a, a pretty good renewable share along with the hydro. Um, what uh, we are doing right now is obviously we need to move off coal. Um, and uh, we're doing that uh, rather than doing two transitions, coal to gas and then gas to green, uh, which is the usual path, which a lot of European countries did. Uh, we said we, we want to skip the gas step altogether uh, for two reasons. One is uh, our systems based on resources that we have uh, locally, domestically. Uh, so we didn't want to put uh, the uh, electric generation system to rely on, on imported uh, fuels. Um, a, we don't have control over the pricing, and B, I think now with Russia, it's pretty clear that uh, um, gas is, um, shall we say, uh, not very reliable uh, fuel for generating electricity, especially. Um, so what uh, we're doing right now is uh, we're building a large battery storage complex, about 6,500 megawatt hours, um, because our peak is uh, during winter uh, at night. So we need to be able to shift a lot of the solar uh, and renewables uh, for use uh, throughout the day. And that, along with the pump hydro, would allow us to shift about 2,000 megawatts, essentially, of load for six uh, to eight hours. Uh, and uh, the other piece that we are doing is uh, we're doing a lot of geothermal uh, because, A, that's renewable, B, that's base load. Uh, and we saw that uh, Turkey in the last uh, seven, eight years actually did a very good, very robust program. They built about 2,000 megawatts uh, of uh, uh, geothermal. We have very similar geologies. So uh, we're in the process of completing the explorations uh, this year and then starting the, uh, the build out of geothermal uh, next year. So by 2026, 28, we hope to have basically a, a lot of storage that will uh, be able to uh, allow us to move a lot of the uh, interruptible renewables, the solar and the wind, uh, into time slots when we need them, and then also uh, quite a lot of base load coming from geothermal. Wonderful, and happy to hear about geothermal, frankly speaking. Um, you know, the world is, has been capitalized moving towards um, solar and and wind energies but like you pointed out I mean, there are some issues with that so uh looking at uh, alternatives and geothermal i know I, I recently came back from el salvador and the government is looking very much into geothermals there as well a lot of related projects i don't know if you if there is some um sharing of uh, best practices there but i would be happy to um mm -hmm. share some of the uh, initiatives there 
uh, Mr. Luxix, while, while we're staying in, 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 on, on the continent uh, before we move beyond, uh, what's Montenegro's take on all this? I mean, first of all, uh, let, let me thank you and, and the Horasis for, for kind invitation to join this, this panel. I think the topic is extremely interesting. And uh, when we uh, start digging about uh, or mining, if we're talking about crypto <laughs> uh, of the data, we figure out that uh, it's not so uh, uh, it, it, it's not, 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 not so straightforward. Uh, you realize that the energy consumption that is required to support the blockchain, uh, the IoT, I mean, generally speaking, digital economy has been growing steadily over the years and uh, uh, some may even claim exponentially. Yeah? So every time you look, look around and uh, try to figure out at least the approximate uh, level of energy consumption, you realize that it equals bigger and bigger a country. Yeah? I remember once it was a uh, uh, reading a few years back, it was uh, the consumption of Argentina. Now it's the consumption of Italy, and so it's growing steadily over the years. Um, but the, the thing is, and the trick is, what's behind that? Um, because normally we perceive that decarbonization, digital economy go well hand in hand together, and that should be the key ingredients of the green transition. But if all this power comes from not really renewables, uh, but from coal mining or, or other similar uh, energy, primary sources of energy, then we, um, then we figure out that uh, the digital economy may not necessarily be in the, that very clean. Plus, um, the supply chains or the value chains when it comes to, for example, battery production could be very polluting. Uh, so we also need to make sure that we're talking here about uh, clean supply chains that are supposed to support uh, sustainable energy approach and sustainable digital economy. So, uh, and, and th that's actually why this whole topic is so fantastic. Uh, not only for our dis because of our discussion, it's fantastic because of all the research, it's fantastic because of the, all the new attempts to, to find out innovations, to, to, uh, to, to innovate, to find out new uh, ways to, to produce sustainable energy. And, and I, I think that that's really, really great. On, on the, uh, talking about Montenegro, uh, what our colleague from Bulgaria had just mentioned reminds me of a very nice pilot project that we did some years ago. You know, UNDP's seat or UN seat in Montenegro is in the so-called ECHO building, which is totally self-sufficient energy-wise because it's using at the same time geothermal and solar. Uh, and uh, so that's, that's, that's why it makes it, it make, makes it great. But the thing is, or the problem is that it's still the only uh, project of that kind. So we need to be, I think, braver. I think to be, we need to be more courageous in, in at least turning all the government-driven uh, facilities into something which is more sustainable and looks like this. That's one thing. The other thing is Montenegro has been, in a way, in the position to consume or to produce most of our energy from the hydro, mm -hmm. mini hydro plants from since in recent years uh, from uh, wind, uh, wind parks. The solar is only going to be uh, more important uh, over years, but there is still a significant chunk that comes from the thermal and the coal. And that is not only the case of Montenegro, that's also uh, as we, if we talk about Bosnia, Herzegovina, Serbia, Kosovo, other countries, mm -hmm. that is going to be a very significant issue to deal with in this process of the social, uh, of, the, of the just transition, uh, uh, if we talk about turning, turning into, into more, into greener sources of energy. Well, um, very good points and thank you, certainly from big picture perspective, the drivers uh, of the new economy and the, that is blockchain and digital. I mean, this is what's on one side causing issues, the other side is a hidden blessing because it seems like it's pushing everybody kind of in these new directions. Uh, let's kind of cross the continent for a moment. And uh, Mr. Shahed, I would like to come back to you. Uh, let's talk about MENA countries, Middle East, North Africa, and what's happening in uh, Tunisia. Uh, many countries in that region are significant energy producers. And it seems like this type of uh, conversation and, and, and reality creates a beautiful opportunity for them to come out to be leaders in this field. What are your thoughts on this? Yes, uh, thank you, Stephen. Uh, first, I would like to tell you that I'm deeply honored to attend this session and uh, to deliver a few thoughts. Um, 
when I was asked to intervene in this subject with uh, such distinguished guest, of course, I thought that probably it would be more useful that I um, talk about MENA region. Um, I mean, let me try to put the problem, uh, energy consumption digitalization for the MENA region. Um, in terms of access to digital technology, the region is, globally speaking, behind the rest of the world, except Africa, of course. Um, even if some uh, MENA countries in North Africa are in Africa. But there is in the MENA region uh, something called recently by the World Bank, the digital paradox. I mean, the region uh, use of social media like Facebook, YouTube, etc. is very high in terms of accounts number relatively to what would be expected given its uh, level of GDP per capita. However, its use of digital tools such as internet to make, for example, uh, uh, to make payment is very low. So there is a lag in integrating technology to improve um, access to other services. Uh, digital payment use in, develop, in developing MENA like Tunisia or Algeria or Morocco is really low. Uh, the average should be around 30% compared to, uh, for example, Latin America or other countries is, 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 is really low. Uh, but at the same time, the MENA region has a monk one of the highest rates of youth employment in employment uh, in the world, probably. In Tunisia, it is around 35%. In Jordan, it is around 37%. In Egypt, in Morocco. Uh, so this paradox is very important to mention the huge potential of the adoption of digital technologies across the MENA countries. So uh, the widespread use of digital services, such as I mentioned, uh, uh, mobile money or digital payment, will boost economy and uh, provide jobs. So the gains from shifting to a more digital economy are so exponential that governments in MENA country will do everything they can to, uh, to, to reduce barriers that prevent such a transition, including managing uh, a high energy consumption. Uh, if they would like to unlock this potential, uh, energy consumption will be uh, probably one among other barriers uh, they have today uh, to uh, improve ICT access, etc. Uh, but the point is that energy consumption is already an issue for MENA countries, either for oil MENA countries or for non-oil MENA countries. Both, both have a growing energy consumption and an increasing demand. But let's say probably different challenges. Um, the oil and gas producer in the MENA countries are economically dependent on oil and gas export revenues, and uh, those countries are particularly exposed to climate change and needs to do global effort to mitigate it and uh, uh, take steps to reduce uh, greenhouse gas emission. The non-oil countries like Tunisia, Morocco, Jordan, those countries are net importers of energy and have a strong demand to develop their uh, young economy. And the recent increase uh, in oil and gas prices is impacting uh, hugely uh, their public deficit and their finance, etc. So the, uh, the point that I would like to mention here is that the MENA countries, despite their importing or exporting oil, uh, they must find a way to address this trade-off between the crucial ICT development and others' use and important needs and the growing and their growing economies uh, and the increasing energy consumption by ICT and others. This is the picture today. It's really um, probably a place more than any other place in the world that we have this strong trade-off now. Thank you, Mr. Zahid. Yes, certainly uh, lots of opportunities and uh, they're beautifully positioned being in the energy field all along um, to kind of move, move the needle a bit. And ho hopefully that's where things are moving. So let's switch a bit from from government perspectives, and, and uh, Ms. Ms. Konstantinovich, I'd like to uh, com now come back to you. And, um, you know, what about private sector? Uh, we, we talked about different perspectives where things should be, and, and I'm thrilled to have you on this plenary as someone who works with uh, many organizations and, and uh, on both sides, innovation, and from investor side with family offices. What are you seeing? What can you share with us? Well, firstly, Dr. Melnick, I'd like to thank you and Horasis for convening this panel on this very important topic and for inviting me to the panel. Um, my esteemed colleagues have mentioned solar, wind, hydro, and geothermal as an organization that's 
evaluated tens of thousands of technologies around the world, I'd like to broaden uh, that solution set to include a couple other solutions that we, based on our analysis, feel are, val are uh, valid and valuable in um, addressing these issues. And they're both, not, both nitrogen based. One is a liquid compressed air solution. And the other is a, a simpler version of it called a, thermos, a thermosiphon cooling system. Both of these are nitrogen based and the first uses ambient and recycled heat to drive uh, energy production. So in considering uh, solutions, there are, uh, there are solutions beyond the ones that are most obvious or well known. And so what we would, from our perspective, like to encourage investors, governments, et cetera, is to really look at the broader solution set and really look at which technologies may be most appropriate for the region and the conditions and the, the specific needs of, um, of a particular project or location. In addition to that, I just wanted to share a data point about um, consumption, about 60% of the costs associated with operating a data center include cumulative electrical and mechanical costs. These include uh, power consumed by air conditioners, fuel storage tanks for generators, and what are known as UPSs or uninterruptible power supplies. Um, and so in, in the process of building uh, projects and solutions and looking at alternatives, uh, what I would suggest is including a broader set of experts and um, innovation um, uh, experts who are tracking these kinds of innovations and are able to uh, contribute to truly the most effective solution and most viable economically and from a sustainability and um, impact on the environment perspective. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, certainly, the, the, the new methodologies and approaches is, um, is what will uh, hopefully bring better solutions because whatever we have now uh, is definitely not sufficient. There's no question about it. And I know there's a lot of R&D and uh, related investment uh, going that direction. Well, I'm surprised I, I haven't heard um, anything about hydrogen from anyone so far. And that's kind of a big, big 400-pound uh, gorilla in the world of sustainable energy. So I'm just curious, any, any region, any countries looking at that uh, from our representatives? Because this is, you know, one of the hot topics from what I see in all the innovation and and um, kind of sustainability summits uh, that I go to. Anyone? Any? No, probably not. I think probably uh, not. I, I think because we're... most of the countries are focused on on uh, making sure that our natural resources are well 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 used. But I think one of the issues which is related to hydrogen is about how you get to hydrogen. Is it a clean way of getting to hydrogen? And I think there is a lot of R and D that has to be you know, organize around that to make sure it's both affordable and clean. Uh, but I, I fully agree with you. I mean, according to many studies, it could be a, a, a really a great support to, to the energy sources. Yeah, absolutely. Mr. Kokinas, I think you were going to say something. Uh, yes. Uh, what I want to say is that uh, there is a lot of ongoing research and experimental work around hydrogen, but the business case is not there yet, uh, mm -hmm. especially for small countries that are island countries. Uh, like like my country. So it might be the solution for the future, but for the time being, is not uh, a primary um, alternative source of energy uh, in, anywhere in the world, and certainly not in Europe. Nevertheless, the European Commission is uh, allocated uh, already a lot of funds around the how hydrogen can become the solution, because you know, battery storage and uh, electric vehicles and all these kind of solutions. Um, they have the, the key element, which is the battery production and the battery disposal, uh, which the equation uh, is not yet clear if the electric vehicle with batteries is, is, is the solution. So this is the skepticism around that. Nevertheless, um, for the time being, hydrogen remains something worth to be explored, but the business case is not there yet. Yeah, thank you. I, th th this is this is a very interesting for me feedback to relay back 
uh, to the community. Uh, Mr. Vasiliev, I'd like to uh, ask you, <clears throat> since this whole new Internet 3.0, the, bl- the blockchain-based uh, activities, and as, as already was uh, pointed out by uh, Mr. Klusik, in terms of you know, the amount of energy that it's using and it's continuing to drive many, many activities, the, all the sectors that I see uh, uh, you know, f- from every industry moving in, in that world. So we're going to need a lot of data centers. And looking at how this whole thing played out in different parts of the world so far, um, you know, there, there's some really disappointing results. I mean, some countries ended up banning some data centers and, you know, taking away the machines and, you know, we, we, who shall re- rename, remain unnamed and uh, nameless for the purpose of this conversation. What's uh, Cypress's take on this, on, on crypto mining, and how do you see this, and, and, and blockchain data-driven kind of data centers? Are you welcoming these businesses these days? Um, any policy specifically for it? Yeah, well, I can't speak for Cyprus, but as far as Bulgaria is concerned, uh, oh, Bulgaria, we, sorry, yes. yeah, no problem. Uh, we do have um, uh, quite a lot of data centers. We also have a backbone connectivity just by the virtue of where, where we sit the, the optical backbones uh, go through Bulgaria, including uh, the backbones through the Caucasus and, and uh, a lot of the, the Middle East uh, connectivity also. Um, and we have a number of data centers that have opened up. Um, we have uh, welcomed uh, uh, the crypto industry. Uh, so far, we have uh, some of the mining activity. We also have quite a lot of activity related to actually IT and programming and uh, development. Um, and we are in the process of uh, opening up a pilot uh, infrastructure for uh, uh, crypto wallet companies and crypto companies um, because we have a unique piece of infrastructure, which is back in the 80s, uh, we built our own equivalent of SWIFT uh, that's now fully integrated into the world payment systems uh, uh, at the backbone level. Uh, So uh, we are opening that up so that you can do uh, crypto to fiat transactions, basically. Beautiful. Well, I think that's a big message to the world. Yeah, I think it's a big message for the world uh, because there are a lot of groups uh, that are searching the world for for friendly locations, friendly jurisdictions. Uh, so what about Cyrus, after all? What's Cyrus well, take on? Uh, we do not have, in terms of Bitcoin or distributed ledger technologies, I, I don't think that uh, we moved uh, in this direction. Uh, in, 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 on a fast track. Uh, we are still on the making of our um, blockchain uh, framework, legal framework. Uh, the fintech industry in Cyprus is very much active on this, but the government is not, uh, does not keep this as one of its uh, main strategic pillars in terms of economic development. Mm-hmm. Um Overall, in, in Europe, overall is is a very conservative, and especially the European Central Bank is not encouraging the the crypto industry. So, I think that uh, it's not just Cyprus; it's the whole of Europe, on average, uh, a bit um, conservative and uh, risk averse uh, to explore these technologies. But from another perspective, looking into the debate, if mm, Bitcoin and blockchain technologies are energy-hungry uh, initiatives. Uh, a recent study I've, I've read from Cambridge Center of Alternative Finance estimates that Bitcoin networks' uh, current uh, annualized electricity consumption accounts for about 0.65% of total global electricity consumption. I find this number extremely high. Uh, that would rank, for example... Um, uh, Bitcoin on the top 30 electricity consumers worldwide if it were a country. So I cannot see how can this number be so high. Uh, Certainly any data center, uh, Mm -hmm. either from uh, AWS or Google or whoever uh, sets up huge data centers needs to be committed and regulated uh, Mm -hmm. so that uh, these data centers are, are not uh, energy. The footprint and the impact of energy is is limited to the uh, very close to net zero. 
Uh, and uh, I'm glad to see that uh, most of the big players like Amazon and, and Microsoft, uh, Azure, and all these big companies that have the data centers for Bitcoin or whatever else uh, have commitments uh, globally that fit the bill. Uh, and uh, from the European perspective, uh, you're probably aware this uh, fit for 55, which is by 2055, zero uh, net zero energy footprint from all over. So um, I don't think that Bitcoin alone has consumes 0.65%. Uh, it's a very small fish in a very huge pot, Bitcoin. Uh, Thank you. Yeah, okay. I, I, I think it's important, and I, and I appreciate this feedback, uh, but I think it's important when we talk about you know, energy consumption, when we talk about data centers, to have a clear separation <clears throat> between, you know, the kind of crypto currency activities, Bitcoin and such, and pure backbone of all this, which is blockchain. Uh, and, we t- and, you know, when we discuss Europe being conservative or everything else, and yes, I mean, the, the cryptocurrencies, absolutely, uh, highly volatile. We could see what's happening now. It's a bloodbath, right, in the world and people losing their fortune and savings and everything else. But I, I, I just think it should not be confused with the underlying technology of a blockchain uh, because that's no doubt where the, the future is going. Every industry moving the direction. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. DLT, uh, distributed ledger technology, and and uh, and blockchain are things to remain, and we will reform and re- reconstruct our economic model. If not the social fabric as well, uh, it's just crypto is something separate. Yeah, thank you, thank you. So we're we're exactly on the same page, and I'm very happy to hear it. I was just shocked. I had an honor of serving in the executive committee of ACPA that regulates. Um, financial planners, accountants in the U.S. and Canada, and we see where all these jobs going between AI, machine learning, and blockchain. And, and, and this is it. I mean, it's, the train is moving and it cannot be stopped. Uh, Mr. Shahid, I'd like to come back to you. Yes. You um, uh, Stephen, I would like to, sorry, to uh, yeah, answer please. your question about hydrogen because uh, I know a bit about this subject since we were thinking in Tunisia about this, uh, this source. The issue with hydrogen is that it is consuming a lot of land. I can give you uh, some an idea with Morocco that uh, recently launched this project uh, to produce six, 650 kiloton of hydrogen. For this, it needs 200,000 hectares. 200,000 hectares. The issue for Tunisia, I remember, it was not easy to find. Uh, so much space and to give it because it's a competition between agriculture and uh, to Morocco now is and Egypt also is having a huge project uh, of producing hydrogen uh, but also uh, it will consume a huge quantity of uh, renewable energy uh, for, I know for Morocco uh, this project will produce 650 uh, kiloton of hydrogen will consume 10,000 kilowatt of um solar and wind energy. So, uh, I mean, this is very challenging and uh, for country now, uh, before moving in the, that direction, uh, those are not very easy project to manage as they're really big, they consume a lot of energy and uh, you need to think about the trade-off between energy consumption for digital or for agriculture or for any other uh, need. So that's, I, I want to give you some figure about uh, this project that I know about in Morocco about uh, uh, hydrogen. Thank you. Thank you. That, that's actually very interesting and, and, and very helpful. I appreciate you sharing this. Uh, Mr. Luxik, you know, for every problem, there is a hidden blessing, right? So we talk about all this crazy energy consumption uh, by um, blockchain driven data centers, by cryptocurrency mining, et cetera, et cetera. But the blessing is, of course, is going to push everybody to uh, kind of harder to move faster and to find creative solutions. And now we have another major push in the world, right? Look what's happening in Europe now and this whole situation um, uh, in Eastern Europe, Ukraine, Russia, and, uh, you know, uh, Mr. Vasiliev mentioned, you know, uh, indirectly the, the, the gas may not be as reliable and we, we, we see what's kind of happening with Russia being the biggest supplier. 
So um, how does all this from what you see and you've served in all these different capacities, um, you know, not, with, as someone who has all these different perspective, on, on, you know, from the level of diplomacy and, and, and from finance area, from economy area, how do you see all this, you know, the, all this perfect storm that's like to be brewing that pushes the world in that direction? No, I mean, you're, you're quite right, because uh, uh, I'm economist by profession, and uh, I very much like uh, Austrian School of Economy, because uh, one of the key aspects that a school offers is whatever you want to do from the economic planning point of view, it always leads to uh, unexpected consequences. Uh, therefore, whatever happens, uh, despite the amount of planning we invest, there is always something unexpected uh, and unintended that, that arises. So I'm pretty sure that uh, uh, this whole uh, uh, the, the tragic situation in around Ukraine will obviously push Europe into, um, into uh, you know, uh, 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 focusing m much, uh, in a much speedier way to di diversify uh, different aspects of the energy security. I I've read that Europe intends to, or EU intends to invest more than 200 billion euros over the next five, six years to try to diversify energy sources and uh, uh, you know, not to be really reliable on uh, only, for example, importing gas from, from, from Russia, because 40%, it accounts for 40% uh, of the gas production, so, consumption. So. Uh, it will definitely lead into trying to figure out different ways of how to bring gas into Europe, but it will also be an incredibly important push to diversify in, in, in different other directions. That, that's one aspect of it, but it will obviously, I think, lead into multiple new waves and new avenues of what's going to happen in years to come. And this whole digital transition, in a way, will, will uh, kind of uh, 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 you know, uh, create a demand for governments to be quicker. Uh, despite having served uh, for so many years in government, uh, I, I've, I tend to grow a little uh, you know, uh, uh, disappointed with how governments operate and how uh, both uh, how, how, uh, uh, you know, consistent they are in delivering, in, in really performing their roles. And that is that is why I believe in this green transition. It will be incredibly important to, to for that that effort to be paired with what, for example, uh, Mrs. Uh, uh, Konstantinovich is doing uh, uh, and, and various other investment funds are doing, because I think business sector should also feel encouraged to drive this change and to also provide adequate boost to, to, and, and motivation to governments to act more quickly. I think there are multiple uh, challenges that, that lie ahead, such as, uh, uh, yes, we're going to turn to more renewables and, and new, new, uh, 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 new primary sources of energy. But what about transmissions? What about interconnections? That's going to be very key because we may be able to produce a lot of solar energy from uh, you know, various parts of the world, but we need to make sure that it, it is in exchanged in an efficient and effective way. There is also, I think, a regulatory uh, shift that has to be taken as soon as possible, which means that we need to be able to adopt new carbon accounting standards as soon as possible to make sure that value chains, the supply chains are really clean and, 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 and green. So the whole scope one, scope two, scope three are, are adequately uh, uh, answered. So there are plenty of uh, challenges. And obviously, politically speaking, globally speaking, there is also this morality dilemma, which is also uh, ahead of all of us, because developing countries that still rely a lot on uh, uh, less clean sources of energy say, well, you know, you guys have already developed, uh, industrialized, and for you, it's relatively easy to talk about turning green. But what about us? What about so many poor people that still need to be taken out of poverty in, in years to come. So I think there has to be more governmental cooperation. But again, I don't believe only in government initiative, but I really believe that there has to be a synergy between governments and corporations and the business sector. Well, this, this transitions me beautifully, uh, Ms. Konstantinovic, directly to you, because thank you for sharing that frustration. I usually uh, expect to hear this from private sector, people being frustrated with the government. 
And this is exactly where I was going to uh, lead my next question to, to you, Lena. But I, before I do, I just wanted to say uh, to all of the other uh, world leaders, uh, participants in this wonderful event and, uh, and guests, uh, if you have any questions, I plan to allocate a couple of minutes at the end um, for a few questions. Although with such distinguished plenary uh, participants, it's always tough to have time. But do please raise your hand if you have questions and we'll try to address what we can. But uh, Ms. Konstantinovich, uh, I'd like to, to come back to this point uh, of frustration. And I'm just very curious, um, what frustrates you uh, uh, from the perspective when you see governments, uh, what they do, what they don't do, and how they do? And what would you like to see being done differently? Thank you for that. And thank you, Mr. Lukšić, for bringing this carbon accounting and carbon markets issue into the conversation. Uh, whenever we are frustrated about something we see, we build a solution and try to contribute to the solution. So, uh, so given that, with what's happening with Article 6 and um, global carbon markets and NDCs, the nationally determined commitments that countries have uh, committed to through the, that UN process, we have, uh, through our nonprofit, built a new initiative specifically to support countries in reaching their NDCs by bringing together carbon market dynamics with um, financing and with solutions. So having these three elements working in concert to assist countries, particularly countries that don't have as many resources as others do, countries in Africa and other parts of the world. So we are actually, I'm here in Washington, D.C. today, meeting with ambassadors um, to convene an Africa summit that would specifically be focused on uh, supporting countries in reaching their NDCs, bringing viable solutions that countries may not be aware of bringing financing through family offices and other uh, financing entities, as well as assisting on the technical side of carbon markets development and, um, and um, carbon accounting. So that is one specific area that we feel is important. As you said, Mr. Lukšić, from an equity perspective, having the access, the tools, the financing to be able to reach these goals and having um, access to that across the world. So that's one thing. And then I wanted to build on what you mentioned, Stephen, in terms of problems, turning a problem into an opportunity and mention one other specific solution uh, that does that very elegantly. So specifically in regions where desalination leaves um, significant salt pond um, uh, resources, I'll call them resources, uh, it'll be obvious why, because in those regions and other coastal areas and hot climate areas, salt brine pound, pound sorry, salt brine ponds can become essentially a giant battery. So one acre of a salt brine pond can generate a megawatt of electricity. So this obviously is relevant for data centers and, and many, many other applications. So these kinds of solutions that take what would otherwise be a, a, a problematic um, uh, waste product and turning it into a productive resource for certain regions would be worth taking a look at. So I wanted to bring that specific kind of solution into the conversation as well. Oh, thank you, Lena, very much. I, I, I love specifics and I love these specific ideas and solutions. And as you put uh, quite nicely, elegant solutions, because there is no better way than to capitalize what many jurisdictions kind of already have at their disposal, just simply not doing. So I, I think, you know, these types of conversations, um, I think, should, should take place over a day or days, not uh, 45 minutes. And we are out of time at this point. But as experience uh, reminds me, uh, these types of conversations never end, and there are always uh, meaningful follow-ups. And of course, uh, we at Harassa schedule uh, these important discussions on a regular basis, uh, pretty much quarterly. So I do look forward to continuing this conversation. And meanwhile, I would just wanted to, th to thank again each and every one of you for taking time from your schedule, uh, from your perspectives. I think we had a beautiful kind of a mosaic of different different thoughts and different er from from geographic perspectives, from background perspectives, from 
private sector perspective, I think this was very successful, at least in my mind, and I have no doubt. Um, I don't see anybody raising their hands, so I just want to say that on behalf of Harassis and all of the global leaders, as well as other participants who gathered here with us today, uh, I just wanted to thank everyone again. And there are more discussions that are important and timely that we prepared for you as part of this Harassis Global Meeting. So please stay tuned. Do not go anywhere. I'm Stephen Melnick of globalpoliticalandbusinessdiplomacy.org, wishing you an enjoyable and productive remainder of this truly exceptional day. Thank you again, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank Bye -bye. you. Bye. Bye, everyone.